Well, for many people, Williamsburg, Virginia is all about history and tradition, a small town stuck in the past with an unwaveringly 18th century identity. The truth, though, is startlingly different. Williamsburg has been a popular and successful mecca for that most modern of entertainments, the movies, for even longer than it has been a living history museum. As you'll hear in this talk, as early as the 1920s, Williamsburg, Virginia was seen as an interesting and promising locale for filming by major movie-making talents. Major New York and later Hollywood stars and film crews would come to town to shoot their historical epics, using the colonial charm and air of authenticity of Williamsburg to give their productions that special something. In addition, Colonial Williamsburg itself would commission several films to document the restoration of the city and educate potential visitors about the history of the area. Eventually, this would develop into an in-house audiovisual production team, creating award-winning educational media and groundbreaking historical cinema. Today, the Foundation's productions have moved into the digital realm with live streams on Facebook and a wide variety of YouTube videos, podcasts, and podcasts. But let's get back to the beginning. So the films and television programs that we feature in our exhibit, Hollywood Comes to Williamsburg, a Century of Movie and Media Productions, as well as what we're going to cover in this presentation today, all reflect the time period in which they were produced. So this means a few of them were developed primarily as works of historical fiction. Um, designed to entertain audiences. It also means some of them have historical inaccuracies or that the viewpoints that they convey do not align with our perspectives today on complex historical issues. And they may depict some of the racial and ethnic prejudices that were commonplace in American society at the time. But they're included in order to tell a complete history of Williamsburg's portrayal on film. And we hope that their inclusion will shed light on some of the prejudices, myths, and misconceptions that Colonial Williamsburg has been seeking to correct through its own educational programming and more recent internal productions. In 1923, movie director D.W. Griffith came to Tidewater, Virginia to create America, a film about the American Revolution. Some of the local filming took place in Yorktown, Williamsburg, and at Shirley Plantation. Griffith was by then well known for his 1915 silent film, Birth of a Nation. Despite being considered a masterpiece of filmography, Birth of a Nation was a controversial film even upon its release and is known for its racist portrayals of African Americans and glorification of the KKK. The premise for America was an unlikely plot involving a love affair between a Northern farmer portrayed by Neil Hamilton and a Virginia Belle played by Carol Dempster. Filming took place in New York, Massachusetts, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. While in Virginia, Griffith met Dr. W.A.R. Goodwin, who at the time was a fundraiser and professor at the College of William and Mary and rector of Grace Episcopal Church in Yorktown. He later became known as the father of Williamsburg's restoration. For Griffith's movie, Goodwin suggested some filming locations as well as a cockfight scene at the College of William and Mary. In the scene, which you can see being filmed here, students fled as wigged 18th century professors appeared to chase away the cockfighters. Several William and Mary faculty members portrayed some of the professors in the film. Dr. Goodwin also donned a costume and acted in the role of Commissary Dawson. And you can see him in this picture with his back turned on the left side of the photo. And he's talking to Mr. Dutch, who was one of Griffith's directors. Unfortunately, both the cockfight scene and Goodwin's appearance were cut from the final film. The movie America premiered in 1924 with mixed reviews. The Howards of Virginia debuted in 1940. Based upon The Tree of Liberty by Elizabeth Page, the film revolves around the experiences of Matt Howard, a frontiersman, in the years leading up to the American Revolution. Howard marries Jane Payton, a gentrywoman living near Williamsburg. 
The two moved to Backwoods, Virginia and soon clashed due to their differing backgrounds. Matt's democratic leanings and Jane's more conservative Tory views lead to estrangement as the Revolutionary War begins. However, love prevails and the two reunite towards the end of the war. Newly restored exhibition buildings, gardens, public greens, and streets in Colonial Williamsburg offered an authentic backdrop for many scenes in the movie. A train composed of 15 cars brought supplies from Hollywood, including costumes, guns, carriages, wagons, and other accessories. Many of these props are visible in these two photos taken by architectural draftsman George S. Campbell showing townspeople watching a militia, militia muster scene where members of Washington's army pass through Williamsburg on their way to Yorktown. In 1956, a popular NBC documentary series, Wide Wide World, highlighted Colonial Williamsburg during a televised visit for a segment of the show. This marked the first time Colonial Williamsburg allowed portions of the historic area to serve as sets for a national television production. Host Dave Garraway took television audiences on journeys to many distinct parts of the United States, Mexico, and Canada, and offered glimpses into unusual aspects of daily life and culture in these countries, ranging from seasonal and leisure activities to heritage sites and profiles of famous historical figures. The telecast aimed to supply a sense of immediacy by having live filming taking place from multiple locations at once to create the montage of segments making up an episode. As one of the highest rated among daytime television shows, Wide Wide World offered Sunday afternoon armchair travel to many Americans. The broadcast ran from October 16, 1955 until June 8, 1958. One of the major scenes filmed at Colonial Williamsburg took place in the Governor's Palace Ballroom, where dancers and musicians reenacted a colonial ball. Other filming locations included the Raleigh Tavern Bar Room and the Palace Dining Room. The live telecast occurred from 4 to 5.30 p.m. on Sunday, March 4, 1956, with multiple crews at each site. Colonial Williamsburg guests viewed the production from television screening areas in the Williamsburg Inn and Lodge. NBC stayed in town to film another live television program at Colonial Williamsburg the next Tuesday, an episode of the Today Show. Also hosted by Dave Garraway, the Today Show episode encompassed conversations with colonial tradesmen, demonstrations of colonial games, cooking at the governor's palace kitchen, and a reenactment of the debate between Thomas Jefferson and Robert Gordon over the Virginia Resolution for Independence. The two televised events allowed Colonial Williamsburg to be experienced by close to 40 million Americans. Cast and crew of the CBS television program, Good Morning, broadcast live from Colonial Williamsburg on July 2nd and 3rd, 1956 in two programs designed to lead up to a special 4th of July celebration in New York City. Will Rogers Jr., son of actor Will Rogers, well known for his roles in Westerns, served as the show's host. While a minor actor compared to his father, Will Rogers Jr. pursued various acting opportunities in the 1950s, including the contract with CBS to anchor its morning program, which lasted 14 months. During the July 2nd program, he introduced viewers to aspects of daily life in Colonial Virginia through the setting of the George Wythe House, where he even tried his hand at making shingles. The next day, he escorted his audience through the Capitol and highlighted events leading up to the Declaration of Independence in anticipation of his special to be held at the Statue of Liberty the next day. Approximately 5 million viewers tuned in to watch the national broadcast spotlighting Colonial Williamsburg. The crew of the NBC children's program, One, Two, Three, Go, was in Williamsburg in March 1962 to film for the half hour show that aired locally on June 2nd. The cast of the Williamsburg episode included host Jack Wiscooley, 10 year old Richard Thomas as Master Dick, Joseph Warren as Thomas Jefferson, Francis Compton as Lord Dunmore, and Richard Morse as the Courier. 
Richard Thomas, who is pictured in the left picture on the left side, went on to become best known for his role as John Boy Walton in the 1970s TV series, The Waltons. He and the crew, he and the cast enacted a possible 1774 event in which Master Dick, an apprentice blacksmith, encounters a dying courier, a patriot, who is trying to get a message to Thomas Jefferson. Master Dick and Jack are involved in delivering the message that Parliament would close the Boston port in retaliation for the Boston Tea Party. Approximately 100 Colonial Williamsburg employees were in the program, which was filmed in part outside the Capitol, at the jail, on the Courthouse Green, and in the blacksmith shop. 123 Go had an estimated audience of 10 million viewers. One of America's favorite canines, Lassie, came to Williamsburg for three days in May 1966 for filming of the Lassie show that aired on CBS in the fall of 1966. Williamsburg is the site of the third episode of a multi-part adventure known as Lassie the Voyager, in which Lassie travels through the South trying to find her owner, forest ranger Corey Stewart, played by Robert Bray, after being separated during a Florida hurricane. In the script for the Williamsburg episode, Lassie eats gingerbread cookies from the Raleigh Tavern Bakery is befriended by an attorney, Jebediah Wakefield, portrayed by actor McDonald Carey and his dog Drummer, runs into trouble with a local turkey farmer, is shot and hides in the governor's palace maze. A trial is held because Lassie is accused of trespassing and the farmer believes she was going to kill his turkeys. Lassie is acquitted and then she leaves the area via Yorktown. Most of the Williamsburg filming called for exterior shots with the interior scenes being filmed in California. The British Broadcasting Corporation arrived at Colonial Williamsburg in 1970 to film segments of the episode, Making a Revolution for their television series, America, A Personal History of the United States. Host Alistair Cook served as narrator and wrote the program's scripts. From various sites around Colonial Williamsburg, including the House of Burgesses and Duke of Gloucester Street, Cook explained the events and ideals leading up to the American Revolution. The documentary grew out of Cook's long-running weekly BBC radio program, Letter from America, in which he offered personal viewpoints on many aspects of American history and culture. Accompanied by the book, Alistair Cook's America, the 13-part series aired between November 1972 and February 1973 and received a Golden Globe nomination. An eight-hour, three-part miniseries that aired in April 1984, George Washington starred Barry Bostwick as George Washington, Patty Duke Austin as Martha Washington, Jacqueline Smith as Sally Fairfax, and David Dukes as George William Fairfax. It chronicled various events from Washington's life between his boyhood and the end of the American Revolution. The first two volumes of James Flexner's biography of Washington served as the inspiration. Filming for the program took place in Virginia and Pennsylvania and included scenes set in Williamsburg at the George Wythe House, the Governor's Palace, the Capitol, and the Raleigh Tavern. November 1978 brought singer Perry Como and a cast of guest stars, including actor John Wayne, actress Diana Canova, violinist Eugene Fodor, and Miss America, Kyleen Baker, to Colonial Williamsburg for five days of filming the television special, Perry Como's Early American Christmas. Crowds lined up in the historic area to watch the taping of various segments that took place at Bruton, Bruton Parish Church, the George Wythe House, the Raleigh Tavern, the Governor's Palace, Tuning's Tavern, the Millinery Shop, the Printing Office, and the Getty House. Perry performed traditional Christmas carols and colonial ballads as he journeyed through different buildings, rode in a carriage down Duke of Gloucester Street, and strolled through gardens. Many Colonial Williamsburg staff members served as extras, including Harvey Cradle, who portrayed an auctioneer in a scene in front of the King's Arms Tavern. 
Como told reporters that he felt the production was the best Christmas show he and his team had ever done and remarked that Williamsburg is typical of what we feel Christmas is all about. Colonial Williamsburg once again provided an 18th century backdrop and gained national exposure when Good Morning America arrived for on-site filming. On May 6, 1986, Good Morning with hosts Joan London and David Hartman arrived in Williamsburg for a live broadcast from the Governor's Palace. The two-hour show included interviews with Dennis Kotner, manager of the Palace Kitchen, several craftsmen, as well as Colonial Williamsburg President Charles Longsworth and Fife and Drum Corps senior members Brady Hoke and Jeff Boynton. Good Morning America returned on December 9th, 1991 to celebrate a colonial Christmas. The ABC Network Morning Show with, Char show with Charles Gibson as co-host and weatherman Christian Spen Spencer Christian aired from the historic area decorated for Christmas. The show with 6 million viewers was broadcast on Duke of Gloucester Street in front of the Raleigh Tavern, the Wig Shop and Golden Ball. The broadcast began with the Fife and Drum Corps and included an interview with President Charles Longsworth and video footage of Grand Illumination from the previous evening. In May, 1993, Fred Rogers, host of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, visited Williamsburg to film segments for his children's program to be aired later that year. One episode aired on September 3rd and included scenes for a segment called Then and Now. Filming took place over two days at various historic area sites, including the Palace Kitchen and the Millinery Shop. Of course, Mr. Rogers, famous for wearing his cardigan sweater on the show, visited with many children while he was in the historic area. The first episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood appeared in 1968 and the last in 2001. 1993 marked the 25th anniversary of the program. Charles Fraser's novel, Cold Mountain, inspired the production of a Civil War epic by the same name starring Jude Law, Nicole Kidman, and Renee Zellweger that debuted in 2003. The plot revolves around a deserter from the Confederate Army, W.P. Inman, who is attempting to make it back to his home on Cold Mountain in North Carolina to reunite with the woman he had started courting at the war's outbreak. Carter's Grove Plantation served as a backdrop for a scene in which a wounded Inman is taken to Confederate Field Hospital just outside a Charleston, North Carolina mansion. On December 21st, 2005, Williamsburg's Kimball Theater hosted the East Coast premiere of The New World. Directed by Terrence Malick, the movie dramatizes the story of Jamestown Settlement with a special focus on the storyline involving Captain John Smith, Pocahontas, and John Rolfe. Much of the filming took place on location in Virginia, and the premiere served as an early effort to begin promotion of the 400th anniversary of Jamestown settlement in 2007. Actress Quarianka Kilcher, who portrayed Pocahontas, and actor Kehlani Kapo, who portrayed Parahud, walked the red carpet at the Williamsburg premiere. Between 2005 and 2007, Colonial Williamsburg worked with executive producers Tom Hanks and Gary Goetzman to coordinate on-site filming of selected scenes from John Adams, a seven-part miniseries that aired on HBO between March 16th and April 20th, 2008. The two men toured Colonial Williamsburg in 2005 to investigate filming locations worked on planning for proposed scenes in 2006 and brought their set designers, cameramen and actors to the historic area for live filming in 2007. Based on John McCullough's biography of John Adams, the program won a Golden Globe for best television miniseries. The main scene created at Colonial Williamsburg took place on the grounds of the public hospital and portrayed John Adams visiting the Continental Army while encamped at Harvard Yard. Other scenes filmed in the historic area included use of the interior of Bruton Parish Church to portray a town meeting at a congregational church, 
and the public jail as a backdrop for a meeting between Adams and British soldiers imprisoned after the Boston Massacre. NBC's Today Show, featuring anchor Matt Lauer and weatherman Al Roker, arrived in Williamsburg on September 24, 2008 for a live broadcast from the historic area to over 7 million viewers. The show was broadcast outside the Capitol and along Duke of Gloucester Street. Virginia was one of four states that the Today Show was visiting as part of their feature on swing states in the November presidential election between candidates John McCain and Barack Obama. The Fife and Drum Corps started the show. Throughout the broadcast, Lauer and Roker talked with interpreters Lee Rose and Ron Carnegie portraying Martha and George Washington. Chef Hans Schadler and Frank Clark, supervisor of historic foodways, talked with Roker about 18th and 21st century foods in front of the King's Arms Tavern. The AMC series, Turn Washington Spies, used portions of Colonial Williamsburg's historic area as a backdrop for scenes in seasons two, three, and four. Cast and crew made six separate visits to film on location between 2015 and 2017. Sites for used for filming included the Governor's Palace, Palace Green, the Capitol, and Duke of Gloucester Street. Various Colonial Williamsburg costume interpreters auditioned to serve as extras on the sets. The series chronicled the experiences of Abraham Woodall, an American colonist who joins forces with his friends to create a spy ring to aid the revolutionary cause. A local premiere event for the third season took place at the Kimball Theater on April 21, 2016. Colonial Williamsburg interpreters joined cast and community members to watch the premiere and then participate in a discussion session afterwards. Well, as we've seen then, Williamsburg has been a very popular spot for outside film and television crews over the years. But how else has the town's history been broadcast to the world? Well, one early medium was the radio. Several radio shows visited Colonial Williamsburg in the early years, including Our Town Talks. And the photo on the left with the gentleman standing at the WRNL banner, that is from Our Town Talks. The people in the photo from the left are Kenneth Chorley, who was president of Colonial Williamsburg, Mrs. Clyde Holmes, and William Tuck, who at the time was governor of Virginia. And they were on this broadcast of Our Town Talks, broadcasting from the council chamber of Williamsburg's Capitol building in 1947. Uh, WRNL is a station out of Richmond, Virginia, which has been on the air since November 1937. The RNL stands for the Richmond News Leader. The station is still on the air today, but is a sports radio station. Another show that visited early on was Let's Go Visiting, a program. Oh, we're still on the previous slide. Um, Let's Go Visiting. That's what you see on the right. And that was a twice weekly broadcast, began in 1945, aimed at farm audiences. It promoted Wayne Feeds and uh, visited different people and places around the country that they thought would be of interest to farmers. It was hosted by Med Maxwell, known as America's Most Traveled Farm Radio Man. And in the picture, you see Mr. Maxwell, Mr. Allgood, and Dr. Middleton broadcasting from in front of the Alcana Dean shop, which at that time was a harness shop and forge. That photo is from October 6, 1950. Another show that visited was Box Pop also called The Show That Travels America. They visited town at least twice. The pictures that you're seeing on screen are from May 12, 1948, when they broadcast from the Visitor Center at Colonial, Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, that was a different Visitor Center building than the Visitor Center today. On that broadcast, they uh, interviewed various local personalities, including interpreters, the Williams Big, Williamsburg Quintet, a local African-American vocal group performed, and um, so that's what you're seeing. Now, unfortunately, I have not been able to find any recordings of that broadcast, but if anyone has a lead on that, I'd love to hear them. But we know that the show had also visited a few years earlier on October 16th, 1944, when the hosts, Parks Johnson and Warren Hull, interviewed personnel from the Naval Training School for Chaplains at the College of William and Mary. And that broadcast was sent out from Camp Perry. And we do have just a brief little audio clip from that to give you a feel for what the show sounded like. All aboard for 
Our Box Pop, the show that travels America to bring you the voice of the people, thanks to the makers of... Tonight, Box Pop travels to beautiful colonial Williamsburg, Virginia, where Pox Johnson and Warren Howe will talk with a group of Navy chaplains. Chaplains who went into action side by side with your husbands, sons, and brothers. So here are your two box poppers, Pox Johnson and Warren Howe. Come in, Williamsburg, Virginia. So that's just a taste of what the show sounded like. Um, in more recent years, other radio shows have come to town. Uh, WHRO, a public radio station based in Norfolk, has visited a number of times, especially with their program Hearsay. Uh, what you see on screen is the host of the show, Kathy Lewis, speaking with Colin Campbell and Rex Ellis from the Kimball Theater for a broadcast. And there have been other um, radio shows, podcasts, podcasts, broadcasting from Colonial Williamsburg as well. Uh, in addition, the sights and sounds of Colonial Williamsburg have been made available nationally and internationally through the distribution of films, film strips, slides, and audio recordings. Now, the goal is not necessarily to make money on these media, but it was not financially feasible for Colonial Williamsburg to put out film strips and slideshows and just give them away. So they tried to find an agent who would charge only the bare minimum to cover the costs of distribution, Unfortunately, they were not able to find any such agent, and so Colonial Williamsburg's own film distribution section was created. And for several decades, the foundation was able to rent out and sell a variety of educational media through their film distribution organization. What you're seeing on screen, this is from the 1970s. This was a brochure advertising, as you see, films, film strips, records, slides, some of you may be old enough to remember seeing film strips or slides in your classroom. Colonial Williamsburg might have produced some of those. Uh, also on this slide, you see um, part of that booklet open. I have it open to in page where they're advertising some of the records they had. On the center column, they note of special interest to teachers was Colonial Singing Games and Dances. That particular record came with its own little booklet with lyrics to the songs and instructions for the dances if you wanted to teach them in your classroom. And the facing page sort of mustard colored. That's the first page of the order, order form. If you wanted to order these for your classroom or educational organization, you would pay a rental fee and you would pay the postage, tell them when you want it. And of course you'd have to send it back unless you paid a bit more and purchased it outright. Uh, Colonial Williamsburg also produced uh, a lot of audio recordings. You see at center there, that band of music, that's one of the earlier records, especially in the 1970s, Colonial Williamsburg began more and more audio recordings. Um, fifes and drums, early music ensembles, tavern music, later on African-American music and stories. Uh, moving on from records, we had audio cassettes, then CDs, and today there's a lot of music available digitally. Uh, at the moment, I believe, Albums from the late 1980s to the present are all available on Apple, iTunes, or Amazon, anywhere you might try to find them. And the Rockefeller Library is actively working to try to digitize some of those older recordings so that we can make them available. So all of this points to the wide variety of media beyond television and film crews that were bringing Colonial Williamsburg to the outside world. But returning to film and television, it wasn't just outside crews coming to town to share the story. Uh, Colonial Williamsburg, as an institution, was interested in recording its story and making its own educational films from very early on in its existence. In the beginning, these were made with outside production assistance. The first film widely distributed by Colonial Williamsburg was co-produced with Eastman Kodak, the 1943 piece, 18th Century Life, which looked at home life, work life, and community life in Colonial area era Williamsburg. And if you go on YouTube or on archive.org, you can actually find that. Someone has posted it. Turning their lens to the story of the restoration itself, in 1950, the foundation commissioned the film Williamsburg Restored, which brought cameraman Art Smith from Cornell to Williamsburg to work on it. What you're seeing in this slide is a still from the shooting of Williamsburg Restored. They're filming some families in the Capitol's House of Burgesses. And it's Mr. Quaid and Mr. Smith at the cameras. That photo was taken September 5th, 1950. The foundation was very pleased with Art Smith's work. And at that same time, the foundation was determined to make movie production more a regular part of their work. 
1951, Colonial Williamsburg invited Art Smith to lead a new audiovisual department, which would create and maintain, quote, the audiovisual library, the photographic section, slide programs, and motion pictures on Williamsburg, its history and significance. Jokingly referred to as 18th Century Fox, the Colonial Williamsburg Productions Department went on to create dozens of films about the colonial era and Williamsburg history over the next several decades. And these films included, and this is by no means a complete list, uh, The Colonial Printer, uh, Decision at Williamsburg. Uh, you can see on screen now, uh, still from The Colonial Printer of 1952. I will admit I have not seen the film, so I don't know why they're in the apothecary shop, but you can certainly see the women's costumes as they would have been worn on the street in Colonial Williamsburg in the 1950s. Other films from this era, Decision at Williamsburg, 1953, Flower Arrangements of Williamsburg, 1953, The Craftsman in Colonial Virginia, 1956, America's Williamsburg, 1958, and the flyer you're seeing on screen, we know, is also from around 1958 because it's advertising just released The Chinese Village, which was a film about a wallpaper pattern you would have seen in the Governor's Palace. And if you could, I realize the print is very small, but if you could read <clears throat> that flyer, you would see that it's listing the rental prices at being between four and five dollars plus postage if you wanted to rent any of these films. Moving on, more films that were produced included w Music of Williamsburg, which came out in 1960. And this is a particularly interesting film. It doesn't follow a traditional narrative structure. There's actually not much in the way of dialogue, but it follows a day in the city of Williamsburg showing the many different contexts in which you would have seen music from a mother singing to her baby, to children at play, to people at work, to enslaved people working in the fields, enslaved people at night, uh, performance of the Beggar's Opera in a theater. So uh, a wide range of contexts in a, a little unusual format. And this is also a notable film because noted ethnomusicologist Alan Lomax was brought in to consult on it. Uh, Lomax was a collector of and expert in American folk music. And Lomax brought in some noted folk musicians to work on this. Uh, at left, you see Hobart Smith, he was a Virginia-born fiddler and banjo player from a long line of folk musicians who had also learned from the African-American fiddlers where he grew up in Saltville, Virginia. He performed in the film. Lomax also brought in some noted African-American folk singers. The photo you're seeing of a group of people standing by a bus is believed to be some of the singers that Lomax brought in for the project. Unfortunately, we don't have identities, uh, identifications for the people in this photo, but we know that the African-American performers brought in for the project included Bessie Jones and the spiritual singers of coastal Georgia, later known as the Georgia Sea Island Singers, Nathaniel Romings, a drummer from the Bahamas by way of Miami, Ed Young, a fife player from Como, Mississippi, Prince Ellis, a jawbone player from Tidewater, Virginia, and the Bright Light Quartet from Weems, Virginia. And if you have an opportunity to come in and see our exhibit in person, we have that jawbone he played on display. Other films over the years included The Colonial Naturalist, 1964, which told the story of uh, Mr. Catesby, who created some beautiful uh, illuminated books uh, showing the flora and fauna of the New World. Uh, the Cooper's Craft, 1967. Basket Making in Colonial Williamsburg, 1968. The Gunsmith of Williamsburg, 1969, Doorway to the Past, 1969, Silversmith of Williamsburg in 1971, Hammerman in Williamsburg in 1973. You might notice a sort of trades theme going on here. Uh, the Musical Instrument Maker of Williamsburg in 1976. If you have any doubt when that movie was made, just check out the fashions. Uh, Conversation with a Wheelwright, 1976, The Williamsburg File, 1978, Search for a Century, 1981. And you can see on this slide also noted archaeologist Ivor Noel Hume working on Search for a Century. Uh, a Glorious System of Things, 1983, Forged in Wood, 1987. The list goes on and on. And again, this is not a comprehensive list. But a standout among all of these productions was 1957's Williamsburg, The Story of a Patriot. 
Now, this was a project on a scale far greater than any previous or subsequent Colonial Williamsburg film production. It was meant to be the centerpiece of a new visitor center complex. It had twin theaters built specifically for it, and it was filmed specifically to take advantage of those theaters. And Colonial Williamsburg's audiovisual department was tasked with providing a state-of-the-art movie experience that would orient visitors both to the history of the American Revolution and the important sites to see in Colonial Williamsburg's historic area. To tackle what was an immense and important project, Art Smith and his colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg sought outside advice from professionals in Hollywood. Eventually, they secured a collaboration with Paramount Studios and the services of Oscar-winning director George Seaton, most famous for his work as a screenwriter on Miracle on 34th Street. The movie was entirely filmed on site at Colonial Williamsburg and the James River plantations of Tuckahoe and Westover. This is really an all hands on deck effort, not just for Colonial Williamsburg and its audiovisual team, but for the town and its citizens. Uh, if we could see the next slide. Many, uh, many people were recruited to stand in as extras in crowd and legislative scenes. In the middle image you see here, this is a bunch of extras standing in line waiting for lunch, and many of them were doubtless locals. My favorite story about local extras is how they needed adult men who were available all day during the day to portray legislators in the House of Burgesses. And so who did they find but the patients at Eastern State Hospital to sit there all day? The picture at the top left is one of the Paramount employees who came in to help keep the ultra wide format VistaVision cameras running for the whole shoot. The other photo on this slide shows behind the scenes of creating the Patriot Theaters in the Visitor Center, which were really cutting edge, used a lot of new technology, very innovative. The hard work on the film paid off. It was a critical success and it's been seen by millions of visitors in the decades since its original release. So Williamsburg over the course of the 20th century truly became itself a filmmaking community, producing both quality and quantity in its productions. Ever changing with the times to keep up with new demands and new technologies, the work of Colonial Williamsburg's productions department also expanded into television and internet streaming as the years went on with a dedicated in-house studio producing and broadcasting electronic field trips and other videos. The electronic field trip series began in the 1990s, and it was designed to bring history lessons to students in their classrooms who were unable to visit the historic area in person. In a successful run that lasted for over 20 years, the electronic field trip program was broadcast to students and on public broadcasting stations nationwide. And it came to cover topics from the first English settlers in Virginia to the Jim Crow era, taking in history, civics, and even the application of math and science to colonial trades. The way it worked is that there would be pre-scripted, um, previously filmed segments talking about different historical subjects. And then the day of the broadcast, they would be interspersed with live studio segments with live hosts and experts. And students in schools across the nation could call in. There was a massive phone bank that would be manned the day of the production, or they could email in questions and some of them would be answered live on screen. And they earned national acclaim for their quality and content and even won several Emmys. And you can see on the slide some of the production staff with some of the Emmys they won, as well as some behind the scenes pictures. And I have a brief video clip from a podcast that was done about electronic field trips that gives you a little bit more behind the scenes view. So if Mary, well, I could play that. The field trip uh, program is an opportunity for us to take Colonial Williamsburg, to take American history right to the classrooms all around the country. We've been working on this program now for the last uh, 10 or 15 years, actually, and the major reason for doing this is to share the importance of this institution and what we stand for with the rest of the country. Uh, what we do is uh, we uh, send a television signal out of here seven times a year um, on uh, public television stations and educational channels around the country. Um, so that kids can see the museum in real time and talk with us in real time. And we don't just do colonial history. We also um, are taking stories about 17th century or Native Americans before Europeans come here. Uh, we're taking them stories about uh, Virginia, but also about New England or 
uh, farther south, we're taking stories about uh, the early 19th century, and uh, we every year do a program that uh, is focused on African American history. And it's not just history, quite frankly. Um, these are interdisciplinary programs. So the uh, electronic field trip also reaches in and, and, uh, and involves your kids with um, literacy standards and, um, and the reading instruction that you do in your classroom. Well, the now, electronic, electronic field trips are no longer being broadcast, but if you're interested in seeing those materials, they are all available online, along with teacher guide and other supplementary materials. You can go to resourcelibrary.history.org. That's where they're currently can be found. And just because electronic field trips are no longer live, it doesn't mean Colonial Williamsburg has gotten out of filmmaking. Uh, they continue to make vodcasts and podcasts, and this became even more active in the last year with the pandemic. Uh, if you follow the Facebook page, you'd see for a while there were almost daily live streams. They continue with Trades Tuesdays, short film segments about different trades, behind the scenes shows with curators and archaeologists. And in addition to this new material, you can still find many of the archival films available on DVD or on the internet. If you come into our exhibit, you'll have the opportunity to watch some of them on a monitor. So in a sense, filmmaking is absolutely still alive and well in Williamsburg, Virginia in the 21st century. From the beginnings of experimentation with the film medium to present such historical dramas as America to today's popular television series such as Turn, Colonial Williamsburg has continuously served as a prime site for on-location filming. It has provided the backdrop for a wide range of programming from children's productions and musicals to news features and elaborate period dramas. At the same time, Colonial Williamsburg's audiovisual teams have created an evolving succession of internal productions that continue to reach audiences around the country. In an interview at the third season premiere of Turn, Samuel Rukin, who portrayed John Simcoe, remarked, I think if you have somewhere that has such an important place in the birth of the nation, you should do everything you can to preserve it. This will just become a bigger and bigger landmark as time goes on. Hopefully this landmark status will continue to apply both to Colonial Williamsburg's role as a museum and its role as inspiration for movies and media productions. With close to a century of contributions to historical filmmaking, Williamsburg has an impressive film chronology and is poised to embark on new ventures as the technology advances. Thank you for joining us today, and we encourage you to come see our exhibit, Hollywood Comes to Williamsburg, a century of movie and media productions in person at the John D. Rockefeller Junior Library. We are pleased to announce that we will now have a live ribbon cutting for the exhibit, and we will be joined by our colleagues, Tracy Golden, Media Collections Manager, and Donna Cook, Associate Archivist, who served as our co-curators. The exhibit will be free and it's open to the public during the library's operating hours of Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And now I'll turn it over to Jenna for the ribbon cutting. Hello, I'm just going to turn my computer around. I am broadcasting from the Rockefeller Library. And if you come to the exhibit, it is just inside. And we have our co-curators of the exhibit, Tracy Gilden and uh, Donna Cook, ready to cut the ribbon. <laughs> so we are officially open and welcome anyone to come see. I saw a question about where we're located. Um, the exhibit, if you come to the Rockefeller Library, you come in the doors and it will be immediately to the right is the room with the exhibit in it. And the Rockefeller Library is in the Bruton Heights uh, Education Center. I'm not sure the address, but we can look it up and find it. it the address is 313 First Street. 
So you turn off of Lafayette Street, you turn left onto Capitol Landing Road and then take an immediate left onto First Street and First Street leads down to the complex. And the library is open to the public, completely free. There's parking on site, it's open Monday through Friday, nine to five. Jenna, I see someone's asking how long it's gonna be open. Uh, Marianne, do you have an end date? I know we're keeping it open longer than we originally planned because of the pandemic. Yes, we're going to keep it. It will be open through the end of 2022. And we're working as well on putting together an online version of the exhibit uh, for those who are out of town and can't come to Williamsburg, which won't have quite all the same things, but still you'll be able to see some of the exhibit online. Right. And that will be in the next few months. So there was a question earlier in the chat about Ronald Reagan and a summit that he held at Williamsburg Inn. Do either one of you know anything about that? Oh, that, yes, that was the economic summit. And that was held, I think it was 1983. And we do have a lot of photography and archival materials relating to that event. Um, that was one of the few times that most of the historic area was closed down um, because they um, they flew dignitaries in on helicopters. They had um, some events on Palace Green in front of the governor's palace. They had meetings at various sites around Colonial Williamsburg. There was a period of time when when all of the participants in that event strolled down Duke of Gloucester Street and they had different tradesmen out. Um, demonstrating their trades and they could stop and chat with them. So there's a lot of interesting documentation about that event. If you're interested, you can make an appointment to come to by the library and we'll be happy to show you. Yes, if you if you wish to visit special collections and visual resources, uh, appointments are recommended, but general uh, browsing the library, you don't need an appointment. If someone wanted to make an appointment, how would you be contacted? Um, well, they can either call the library's main number or they can, we have a generic email, which is R-O-C-K-L-I-B at C-W-F, that's F as in foundation, dot O-R-G. Well, thank you very much for attending. We appreciate your support and in, encourage you to come by the library to see the exhibit. And also if there's anything we can assist you with in terms of research and access to resources in our library, we're happy to help you. I second what Marianne said. And if you are aware um, personally of any recordings or other things that were done either publicly or privately of audiovisual recordings in the historic area over the years, we would love to hear about them.